Welcome to Global Medical Office Dialogues. Including patient reported outcomes, or PROs, in clinical trials opens new and meaningful pathways to understanding medical care from the patient's point of view. By combining clinical and patient reported endpoints, trials featuring PROs can identify opportunities to improve patient health status and define treatment goals. Christer Kram is Fresenius Medical Care's expert director of patient experience for clinical research. He is leading the company's evolution from disease-centered to person-centered integrated trial design. Welcome, Christer. Thank you very much, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. We're glad to have you, and I'd like to start today with trying to understand how you look at this shift from disease-centered to person-centered care in research trials and certainly related to qualitative research. That's really a very, very exciting and important topic that has evolved over the last couple of years. A few years back, most trials would have been designed really around the disease and focused on maybe understanding how a certain medication or a product would lead to physiological changes in the patient. The patient was much more the object of attention than actually the subject participating. And over time, of course, patients and persons, like we all are, grew more and more interested in what was going on. The opportunities of electronic participation, patients also demand to be part of trials. So this has really led to a discussion among all those stakeholders in, in healthcare, how to really focus on the individual and this individual's needs. That first led to some evolution towards what we would call patient-centered clinical trials, meaning that patients would be heard, given a voice. So maybe there would be panels that involve people, for example, who have kidney disease, and they would be able to, to say what they would like. But often enough, that really falls short of what is actually needed, because generally speaking, all of us can become sick. And that means in all sorts of circumstances, we would like to be treated as individuals and be heard. And also, it fell short of the other stakeholders in the care process the nurses, the doctors in the clinics, other healthcare professions related to care who actually have meaningful information to design a clinical trial and also to shift the perspective and shift the actual clinical research and also the product development. We as nephrologists and certainly in kidney disease care, spend an enormous amount of time looking at quantitative data. We're interested in a lot of analytical elements of this. We measure performance in many cases on numeric items that come out of blood work or physical assessment of the patient. Talk to us a little bit about the distinction between qualitative and quantitative methods in research because I think that they're really quite different, and many people don't recognize the uniqueness of the qualitative data. It's really a, a good question of whether data is that different, because if we look at classical lab parameters, we would often consider them as a definite source of truth. And often enough, these parameters are also only indicators that we use as proxies for other information about physiological processes that are going on. With psychological data, of course, there is a difference in that we draw conclusions about something that we cannot immediately measure, right? So of course we could do a brain scan of a patient who's perceiving pain and we could understand something about the dynamics going on there. But ultimately, it's about the perception of the individual. And 
all of that makes this data qualitative. But at the same time, if individuals report this consistently and the directions of the reported data is identical, it means that you can actually make this quantifiable and you can analyze it on a, on a larger scale. And I think it's, it's important to realize that in that respect, what we are doing using this qualitative information as proxies for other things going on is as valid and as important as any other data that we collect in the clinic. Are the techniques different? I know when you have free text and free conversation and comments from patients, you have to use novel techniques to try to dissect the meaning from that when comparing it to other patients that are in a trial. How do you approach that? What actually happens is that, let's say you want to understand something about anxiety, let's say, in, in a patient and, and the treatment setting. You would probably come up with all sorts of ideas, what that would mean for a patient. You would maybe discuss this with patients in a panel, and then you would conduct qualitative interviews. So these would be concept elicitation interviews, either in group settings or with individual patients. And these would be recorded, and then they would be coded. There would be specialists, psychologists actually writing down every word and also understanding, okay, how often does somebody mention a certain phrase, in what context? And out of this information, specialists would actually phrase questions and identify different aspects. If we were to take the example of pain, there are different types of pain. It could be about the length of the pain, the intensity of the pain, where the pain happens. And all of this could be written down and it would lead to a construction of a pain survey. And that could be disease specific. So it could be related, let's say in, in hemodialysis to, for example, needling pain or something that is related to um, the actual care setting. And then this survey would be once again given to patients and there would be a cognitive debriefing process to see if this is what somebody was actually going through, if this was meaningful, if something is missing. And then in a, in a next stage, this questionnaire would then be distributed to a larger group of people in that circumstance and be asked to fill in the survey. And then there would be quantitative statistical methods used to understand if individual items actually contribute to understanding that particular concept. In this way, it is possible to actually validate a questionnaire, a survey for a specific subject. And then that could be used in a clinical research setting. How do you avoid bias in qualitative assessments when you've got cultural, language, environmental conditions that are so different from patient to patient based on their own background or their own circumstance? And that can be everything from their educational level to literally what their native tongue is. Just how do you approach those elements? A lot of the research takes place in limited um, circumstances. So of course, the more advanced healthcare systems will be able to do more of this research. And one of the things that will happen there is you would look for a diversity of people from different backgrounds, the age structure, the, the underlying cause maybe of a disease, if it's related to a particular condition, to social backgrounds. Also, if somebody's a native speaker of the language or not. And all of this would then form part of the development of the tool. But it's equally important then that if a questionnaire has been developed in one place, it doesn't mean that it is actually valid in another. So what would then actually need to be done is, let's say you will have developed a questionnaire for patients with cancer, it does not necessarily mean that the same questionnaire is going to work in patients who have kidney care. 
So um, another round of qualitative interviews ideally would take place. And then you would assess if this, this is actually appropriate or not, if individual items need to be added, individual questions need to be added, or some have to be removed. And another aspect, of course, is, is that these things can change over time. So a questionnaire would have to be revisited. Nowadays, luckily, because of the advancements in, you know, in the way we even talk, right? I mean, we can be in different places and still have this conversation. It is actually possible to not have questionnaires that are static. So 20 or 30 years ago, you would design such a questionnaire, write it down, it would have two pages, three pages, and it that would be it, right? And this would be distributed to an individual, they'll fill it in, maybe a question is missing or not, somebody will get this back, we'll have to interpret it. This has fundamentally changed now. So you will be able to, to actually hand out a questionnaire to a patient on their own electronic device. It is also actually possible to get to have this read out by computer voice or by another individual, which was and voice recognition. And it is actually possible to create basically a toolbox with all sorts of questions that are related to the subject that you want to find something out about. And as time passes by, you can actually replace these items if they fall out of use. So let's say maybe 20 or 30 years ago, people would play a specific sport or they would use a television and or a telephone and that telephone would have, you know, a dialing space and nowadays nobody uses that anymore. So you can replace that question and then on the go see if another question is more appropriate. And that is also something we try to do because we want to make sure that questionnaires evolve, they are consistent and patients or people simply filling in that questionnaire and entrusting us with information don't feel that it's a burden to them. So it, it would just be more similar to a natural conversation. In clinical trials, the patient's condition can be very different where they're starting from. I'm curious whether there's the opportunity to do things like discrete choice surveys or other kinds of tools to elicit the next question from how the first question is answered, for example, and how to try to elicit what a, a result is by asking some corollary question about their environment, their life, how they're doing living with the disease. I'm curious whether in clinical trials you can get that deep into the dynamic nature of the kind of questions you're asking, or is it strictly you've got 10 questions, we've got to finish those 10, and that's all we can ask for the clinical trial. Are the trials becoming more dynamic in their ability to capture data? They are. It's a very dynamic process, as you mentioned. And of course, what needs to be made sure is that the data is very high quality and that there is no bias introduced related to that. But it is actually the case. So the current evolutionary stage would be to have electronic questionnaires that are adaptable. So let's say you would talk about a, a specific subject in that questionnaire or you know the, the questionnaire would evolve that way. And then there is a database behind that that would choose a question on the same scale. So you would have a scale and first you may want to narrow down and say, if it's about, let's say, physical functioning, Maybe the, the questionnaire, if it has not been filled in by a particular person before, would ask with a very general question like, can you walk up the stairs or how many flights of stairs can you walk up? And as the questionnaire, so to say, or the system behind it gets to know the person filling it in, it would become more specific, like how many flights of stairs can you walk up or what is your usual exercise routine? has that exercise routine actually changed? So the next stage that 
is probably coming and there is development in that direction is actually that the, the conversations become more natural. As I just mentioned, so that it would really be about, oh, I haven't heard from you for two or three days. Can you let me know if you went for a walk yesterday morning to understand about the actual physical activity level of a patient? But that is something that we definitely still work on. And we need to make sure at the same time that the data and the feedback we get back is really valid then. I think the integration of our sensing devices, our diagnostic devices, and other sort of classical ways that we look at physiology, combined with asking patients intermittently about their, you know, their condition, how they're tolerating living with their disease, all those things look like opportunities to get a better picture as opposed to a 10, 12, or 60 question questionnaire intermittently in the daily life of the individual, having them answer one or two quick questions every two weeks or something may actually give us a different way of looking at this qualitative data. Absolutely. And also it will allow us to develop a different kind of perspective on treatment routines, right? So you might identify when physiological problems take over, um, create a negative spiral that you can prevent. So if you get data and often physiological data changes quicker than the, what happens in the perception of the patient, but it can also be the other way around. So it's important to understand that, that yeah, there can be a feedback round basically. And that is definitely something that will help not only change clinical trials, become really agile, but also help to inform about treatment choice later on and the actual clinical care setting. And in the past, these two domains have remained relatively separate from each other. And that is also related to product development. So classically, product development was very much driven by the technological possibilities. So you could construct a dialyzer and then there was the opportunity to change the pore size and that would probably lead to advancements in filtering out more uh, or different molecules. Now the perspectives are changing because what does that actually mean? If you filter out a particular molecule, does that mean that a patient have, you know, less of a headache once per week? Or does it mean that that patient may, for example, participate more in social roles? And even though this may at first seem to be far-fetched, it actually is not. Because if we develop products that, for example, do not activate the complement system, which lead to less inflammation, it could well be that a patient will feel that he is more willing and able to participate in social roles. And it is therefore important that we start from the patient and their individual daily lives. And especially the aspect that you mentioned about, you know, intermittently checking in with the patient, let's say every two weeks, what we currently really try to do is we try to understand at least in, uh, specifically um, related to nephrology in clinical research with kidney patients, is to understand when do patients actually feel something is changing? Is that before dialysis? Is that during dialysis? Or afterwards, how do they feel during the time that they're not on dialysis? And to really understand, okay, how is the recovery time? What sort of symptoms are present at what particular moment in time? And that will help us to connect these different people together. So somebody from, you know, production facility or somebody who is really in that research and product development will be able to understand what that actually means. And a clinician will, um, also be able to change their strategies of care. So they 
might want to focus more on, let's say, pruritus or fatigue that may not have been present so much because patients would simply accept that this is part of the condition they have or there may be other things that take center stage while they see a physician, for example. And this is definitely something we want to turn around and identify what really bothers people and make their voices heard. Your recovery time has been probably one of the most obvious ways to connect the treatment we give, which has a lot of quantitative measures to it, to measures that are really related to how patients function. Let me switch gears for a minute and ask you about two particular clinical trials and the experience of those in getting the field better acclimated with regard to qualitative data, patient reported outcomes, quality of life. So tell me a little bit about SONG and the standardized outcomes in nephrology process and those studies and what have they done to sort of advance this part of the field? SONG is an in initiative to standardize treatment parameters in nephrology and in the publications of nephrology. So basically what, what happened was there was a group of very ambitious people coming together and trying to figure out what is really important for patients with kidney disease. So these would be academic researchers, nephrologists, but also clinicians, people in industry, and for certain, the patients themselves. And what happened was there was something called a Delphi process. So all of these stakeholders were asked what they thought was most important. And for the first time, it actually came out that these perspectives were very, very different from each other. Certainly, the perspective of the physician is to yeah, improve the lifespan and reduce hospitalization. But obviously, health-related quality of life aspects would also be seen, whereas for patients, that would be the major concern or one of the major concerns they have to be able to actually enjoy the time they have to not be prone to fatigue. So what happened was that these were combined and there was a process by which this was standardized. So for different treatment modalities available like hemodialysis and center, these variables were defined. So there were standard variables like hospitalization, but also fatigue that now have to be reported in every clinical trial that wants to be published. And that has definitely made a big impact because in this way, we can compare the results of trials on a common metric. And it would actually lead to real quality improvements that focus on all the stakeholders' perspectives and in particular, the ones who actually have the disease so that they can make sure we progress. I think certainly the expectation that quality of life, patient reported outcomes in these measures will be part of clinical trials has changed the expectations in the field. Last question I have for you is just, I know you've been involved in this broad consortium called CONVENCE that is studying HDF, uh, hemodiafiltration. How has that impacted sort of also the way that patient reported outcomes and quality of life measures are looked at in a large multinational clinical trial? The CONVINCE trial is run by a consortium that got financed by the European Union's Horizon 2020 grant. So it's financed by European taxpayers. And the EU is really, really interested in understanding differences of healthcare provision and access to care among its member states. Now, the EU is extremely diverse in terms of the economic development, as well as, you know, the cultural backgrounds of its member states. And actually, 
this has a very big impact on the way we do research because the EU is not only looking at understanding basically differences between dialysis modalities and under what circumstances they do better, but to really say, okay, how do patients perceive that difference? So within Convince, we developed a new approach to measuring patient reported outcomes and to actually design a toolbox of aspects related to health related quality of life. Starting from the physiological basis and uh, understanding, for example, symptoms that happen during dialysis, as well as general symptoms via actual functionality. So if patients are depressed, patients are fatigued, to the true evaluation of their situation. Can they participate in certain roles? And the, the real quality of life that then follows. So we create a lot of transparency and also a level playing ground for everybody participating in research. And it will also allow actually to understand the circumstances under which the patients live and the, the psychological situation of the individual as well. So that actually is quite important because it is truly person-centered. There have been a lot of different discussions with patient organizations in different countries. We use questionnaires that were actually originally developed in the United States. It's promise-based, but we then actually apply them in the European setting. So they got translated and we discussed this with the patients to see if such an approach would be viable globally. And I think that will contribute a lot beyond nephrology because it, it will actually allow researchers, clinicians, patients to discuss about what matters to them irrespective of where they are. And I think that is truly important because it is not limited to the more advanced healthcare systems like the US and some countries in Europe, but it can actually be applied elsewhere as well. And it's open. <laughs> Today we've been speaking with Krister Kram about the impact of qualitative measures, patient reported outcomes on not only clinical care, but clinical research. And I think it's been very informative to hear your perspective on how this evolving part of our field is developing and maturing. So thank you very much, Krister. Thank you very much, Frank. It was a pleasure.